you can know you believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, right here. First John chapter five, verse 13. John is writing to people of all kinds and all sorts, but the primary audience are believers. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So that's the criteria you believe that you may know you have eternal life. So John would not be telling someone you have eternal life when they can't even know if they believe. So here's what we can draw and glean from scripture. Uh, you can know you have eternal life because you can know that you believe. How do you know you believe? Um, there's going to be, well, that's a good question, isn't it? High five me. If you are wrestling with the question of how do I know I even believe? Um, that doesn't automatically mean you don't believe. That's what some people jump to. They conclude, if I'm even doubting whether or not I believe, then I can't be a Christian. Whoa, hold on. Where in scripture and where in reality is that true? Sometimes that can be an indication, but that's not the, the automatic conclusion, right? So we should reason through these things. I will say this, there will be evidence in one's life. And I used to run to the evidence and go, see evidence, you know, godly character, good fruit being produced in your life, love for God and love for people, a growing love for God and love for people. Do you see a growing obedience to God and his word? Do you see a conviction of sin? Do you see a desire to live holy? And when you're tempted by sin, you have a desire to not be tempted by sin. Um, do you see like a, a new heart and a new conscience where, you know, you, you love the things of God and you, and you had this hatred for the things of, of the world and Satan? And, uh, do you see uh, evidence of spiritual gifts in your life and the spirit of God comforting you and the spirit of God, um, you know, leading you into the truth and reminding you of what you've read and what you've learned? Do you see the Spirit of God moving and directing you? Do you see any vibrant prayer life? Do you see a desire to read God's Word? All, all those things, we could wrap up in a list and go, do you see this? And you can check mark each box. But at the end of the day, even that can leave me going, yeah, but I'm, even though I see all that, I doubt that I believe. So the issue is not with God. The issue is with your own ability to believe. And that's, where I think a lot of people get hung up is they get so caught up on them and me and the self-centered, am I believing good enough? Am I believing? The, the, the object of our faith is Jesus, not your own ability to believe. And you go, how can I believe in my own ability to believe? That, that's what it seems when people ask questions like, how do I know I'm believing good enough, hard enough? It's almost like they've taken faith and they've made it this this activity they have to do good enough or hard enough. And in scripture, I've gone through faith, uh, defining faith appropriately as, you know, faith is always going to be expressed in action, obedience, trust that actually marks the life of a person and fundamentally changes them. If I take God at his word, then I'm going to do what he says, right? And some people go, wow. So if I trust God, I'm going to live perfectly. That, that's not what it says says there will be a trajectory of your life that is aimed at God's word to, to please him and to do what he says. So faith is an action word. That's what it is. It means to trust in, to take God at his word, to lean on Jesus, to re rely on Jesus, to look to Jesus. And somehow we've taken faith and our ability to believe and we've made it the object of our own faith. It's weird. I, I don't know how the human mind can do that. But I've seen it happen in not just my life, but other people's lives where they're so focused on how well they're believing that they're no longer looking at Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12. And also you got to know the gospel. Do you know the actual biblical historical gospel message of Jesus Christ? The issue of sin, the, the response of God's love, the son's atonement, our response to that in faith and repentance. This is what it says. It says, look, let's look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he's seated at the right hand of God. In other words, the object of my attention and focus is not my own ability. It's not my own performance. Some people take 
fruit inspection passages like Galatians 5. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Or Matthew chapter 7, where it talks, or Matthew chapter, yeah, Matthew chapter 7, or John 15, where it's like, you got to bear good fruit. And if you're a good, if you bear good fruit, you're a good tree. And they live their life just inspecting their fruit just counting how many apples do I have? How much joy do I have? How much love? And they've begin to trust in um, what is supposed to be evidence of faith, not the object of your faith. Obedience, holiness, the fruit of the Spirit, these are evidences of faith. They're not the object of my trust and faith. And so many people twist it. They go, well, God says there's going to be evidence for belief and faith. And well, hold on. Where in scripture does it say to look to your own obedience and performance and fruit and and success as a reason for, for, for this or as something to trust in and believe in? I'm just supposed to look at my life and go, I see evidence, but I'm not going to focus on the evidence. I'm just going to focus on Jesus. This is the difference. People who look to Jesus... And they're just constantly mindful of the gospel and God. And they're just trying to focus on him. They will see a lot more good, natural, organic fruit in their life that testifies to their faith than the person who's constantly introspective. And there's nothing against self-reflection and being introspective, but obsessively and to the point where it's not healthy anymore. And it leads you to a kind of condemnation because you're holding yourself to a standard God doesn't hold you to. And you're like, I didn't obey this much this week, so I can't be a believer. And it, it, it gets weird. I know I didn't answer the question the way you asked it. But that was the direction I really thought well, I was supposed to take it. The answer is, how are we confident that we believe? Because you are confident of what Jesus has done. Well, how do I know I'm confident in what Jesus has done? Your life will testify to that. But your life is not going to be the reason or the object of your faith and trust. It's just, an, faith is always with witness. Faith is never without witness. Your life is testimony. The Spirit of God testifies in you. So, I could take you to Galatians chapter 2 or 3. I could take you to or 4. I could take you to Romans chapter 8 all about the adoption. The Spirit of God, He bears witness with our spirit. So, do you see, and I know this is like so, you know, hard to practically bring down to our to our life and go, how do you even define the Spirit of God bearing witness with our spirit? The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. He does. And it seems to be mostly, not just with confidence and a sense of assurance and comfort, but with the evidence of my life changing and my heart changing and my, and my mind changing. That's how I'd answer your question. Because again, people hear sermons where it's like, if you really believe the evidence will be there. And the pastor doesn't say, but by the way, don't obsessively look at the evidence all day, every day, and then, you know, all, the whole life God has given you is just obsessively looking at all my fruit and counting like Scrooge, counting all his money. I don't know why the image came to mind. That's just the image that does. I picture Scrooge just going, mm, yes, piles of money, and he neglects his family. I think we do the same. We become so obsessively introspective to the point that we're not even looking at Jesus anymore. It's all about counting our, our good works and our efforts. So. Ah, Talia said I answered that question. Good. 